Good evening, everyone. My name is Kevin Delgado. I'm the director of the School of Music and Dance, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this very fun, interesting talk, workshop, symposium on hip hop dance. Um, I would. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this event. We have lots of wonderful symposia on campus. Uh, many of them are very lecture-based, but tonight's gonna be a little different. We have lecture followed by a dance workshop, followed by dance performances by students here from SDSU and um, from other universities. So this is gonna be a really wonderful event. It's curated and hosted by my colleague, Dr. Chu Yang O. Oh. And let me introduce her for you. Dr. Chi Young Oh is a Fulbright Scholar and Associate Professor of Dance Theory here at SDSU. After receiving her PhD in Performance Studies from UT Austin, she worked as a visiting professor at Hamilton College in New York. Her book, K-Pop Dance, Fandoming Yourself on Social Media, became the number one Amazon new release in communications and pop dance in July of this year. She's been invited to, to give book talks at NYU, UC Berkeley, UC San Diego, University of Leeds in the United Kingdom, and Seoul National University in South Korea. Her award-winning scholarship has appeared in global media, top-tier journals, anthologies, and keynote lectures. Come on in, come on in. We're gonna be, we're gonna be friendly today and informal. As a graduate of the Kirov Ballet Academy, a leading ballet school, she received international dance competition awards and performed worldwide as a professional dancer before entering academia. Please join me in welcoming my colleague, Dr. Chu Yang Oh. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, it's very nice to see some of you actually in person. Um, Dr. Delgado is one of the most respected colleagues in our school, and also he's my role model. So I'm really grateful to have him um, for giving us the welcome speech. So today I'm gonna have like a 30 minutes of lecture about K-pop dance, and I practiced um, okay almost midnight yesterday, so that I can teach you a 50 second of dance challenge. I hurt my back, but I'm gonna try my best. So we are gonna have 20 minutes of dance challenge workshop, and we have a volunteer student presenters who will be performing K-pop dance. You ready? Yeah. Okay, let's go for it. Um, I know she doesn't look like me at all, and it makes me a little sad, but um, it was like, uh, let's say, um, almost 20 years ago, I was ambitious dancer, and I wanted to be like a professional dancer performing worldwide. I did as a dancer, but you know, um, I found myself keep asking money to my parents because I couldn't pay my rent. And all those experiences taught me that um, maybe there's something that I could do to sustain myself. And as a result, I applied a PhD in performance studies. So it is a discipline in communication study or theater or dance. We basically analyze identity, like racial, gender, sexual, even national identities as a performance. Because I learned that, I, I started dancing when I was six, and I performed a lot of different roles, sometimes wearing blonde wig and light foundation in ballet um, piece. And I learned that um, we are performing our own self and identity on a daily basis, like a dancer performing on stage. So that was the book that became uh, pretty popular, especially for an academic book. It is based on an, um, interviews of around 40 K-pop dancers in LA, um, also New York, mostly in Southern California, including professional dancers, student dancers, backup dancers, and also professional choreographers. I'm gonna give you a little bit of a heads up about the um, subtitle. So whenever I interviewed, and some of the students um, who participated in the study are here today to perform, I was deeply moved by um, their passion and also their genuine interest to perform K-pop dance. 
And because I'm going to play some videos, what they do is usually sort of imitate the original K-pop choreography, including lip singing in Korean, wearing makeup, and clothing like K-pop idols. But my discovery is that they are actually not interested in imitating those idols. They are actually wanting to be a fan of themselves. And in order to make that happen, they are using K-pop. That was sort of my discovery. So I wrote this book um, mostly for student dancers who participated in this system. My research has covered in a lot of media, most, um, and also one of the most recent ones was aired more than 100 countries. So, with all this background, I'm going to explain what K-pop dance is, and then moving on to K-pop dance fandom. Like I explained, a short intermission and workshop, and then performance demonstration. Okay, what is K-pop dance? Any idea? What is K-pop dance? Although it's a little self-explanatory. Anyone? So maybe it's a dance dancing to K-pop music, right? So, so I'm gonna start with what K-pop is. It is basically South Korean pop music. Don't ask me whether it's from North Korea, okay? Just Google what North Korea is. So it combines a lot of um, artistic and also cultural elements, both from Western and Asian countries, and they do hire a lot of talented artists. I deliver a, um, I was invited to a research symposium last week at UT Austin, that's where I got my PhD, and a freshman student told me that he actually got accepted to SM Institute. SM Entertainment is like the biggest K-pop agents, and he's freshman, and now he's like taking a lot of dance classes because he's a little concerned about what if all the other trainees are already so good at dancing. So um, it becomes really global in terms of its institution, education, and also production. What I'm interested in the most is that how many performative elements it has, which means basically you'll be watching um, a lot of dance videos. And dancing is as important as singing. In the book, I analyze the evolution of K-pop dance. That's around the 1980s when I was born and people were still doing those choreography even back then. And on the left side, nowadays K-pop idols are a little bit like an influencer or entrepreneurs. So they create their own business and the major tool they use for the marketing is K-pop dance and music. Including, including the TikTok dance challenge. The book also provides a detailed case study of BTS. You know BTS, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so the book cover comes from one of the BTS members. His name is Jimin. And um, I was really fascinated by So the performance was inspired by Korean folk dance. In Korean folk dance, we have a style um, when a dancer is imitating the movement of a bird, it should be a jump, but I'm not gonna try it because I'm wearing high heel. So that image inspired the um, cover photo, of the, the cover drawing of the book. And a little bit of behind the story is that the artist used to be a K-pop backup dancer, but now he's retired um, only in his early 40s. But I really appreciate the artist's dedication as a K-pop backup dancer and now producing his own inspiration as a graffiti artist. So the chapter explains BTS as modern dancer, um, Korean folk dancer, and male dancers as warriors that has such a long history from capoeira, hula. We had male dancers who used dancing to boost their stamina to prepare themselves before going into a war. As you already know, um, one of the reasons K-pop draws a lot of attention both in media industry, entertainment industry, and also academia, is that we do not have 
a wide range of representations of Asian American or Asian, and that is certainly one of the reasons why a lot of global youth are interested in K-pop. However, today I'm going to focus on K-pop dance fandom and why it matters and why it's also important to, not just to me, but also hopefully to your generation. The book became the arguably the first book that theorized our consumption of dance on social media. Please kindly raise your hand if you have TikTok app. Okay, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. That means you are my age. Okay, so. K-pop is mostly circulated through social media. And the book, and that was the hardest chapter to write, um, I argue that social media is a backstage to socialize and also front stage to perform. What I mean by that is that it used to be um, if we have a dancer performing here, after the show, they would go to the dressing room or in the hallway so that they can socialize with the audience or maybe going to a pub after the event. But nowadays, whenever you're liking a comment, disliking, or leaving some messages, or sharing it on your social media, as you know, you're participating the socialization or socializing yourself on this platform. And also, you can anytime post to your video to share. Um, it could be five seconds of dance challenge, or it could be like a three minutes of um, music video choreography. <clears throat> I think the most important intervention of social media is that it has democratized the opportunities to perform. Is there anyone who performed on stage like this stage before? Something like conventional theater stage? Stage? Oh, that's pretty much a lot. So maybe like uh, 10 people around. Have you ever um, danced on social media? Have you ever performed on social media? If you did your assignment, you are supposed to do, right? <laughs> so, one of, one of the reasons is that it's just so difficult to perform in a space like this. It is expensive, it needs a lot of stepping, and we have such a wonderful staff sitting behind us and also sitting here. So, without all these professional steps, we cannot make a show in theater. But, on TikTok app, you actually have all the functions, right? You can change how you look, you can also modify the speed, so you don't need to hire all these professional staff members to present a performance. And I found that Samsung released a new phone and it doesn't even need a tripod because a lot of people are actually doing um, more and more interested in creating a content that includes singing and dancing. And I think the advertising is featuring a cat. And it seems like if a cat does, you can do that too. And I think that's the mindset of social media fans. It is alluring the audience, saying that you can do that better, right? <laughs> um, as a dance historian, a quick reminder. So that was published seven years ago. People actually anticipated those big changes way before COVID-19. So what they wrote is that there are, so um, seven years ago, two full-time dance critics in the United States. I know it's not president or vice president of the United States. So if it is a um, job category, they maybe need at least like 100 people. So what that means is that the dance education has been so democratized. People do not give much attention to elite critics or let's say um, highly educated people's 
artistic critics on performance. Then what do you think? That what are the opinions we are interested in nowadays? If you do not read the reviews on newspaper, then what do we read on a daily basis? Yeah. Exactly. Or sometimes you just look at the star, like four star out of five, right? So, art was considered something not quantifiable, right? However, nowadays it is actually quantifiable by the number of views or the public's comment that doesn't, you, you do not need a dance degree to comment on a dance performance on YouTube, right? But that wasn't the case. In order to publish your criticism on a newspaper or like a New York Times, you have to be internationally recognized, recognized critic. So all these social media and those things is actually giving your generation enormous opportunity. And sometimes it's so enormous, so it, it becomes very confusing. But it is giving you a lot of opportunities. So now let me move on to K-pop cover bands. So these are the photos of students who participated in my interview, mostly in Southern California in UCLA, UC San Diego, um, USC, also UC Berkeley. And as you can see, if you look at those photos, it is quite clear that they get the inspiration from the maybe makeup, hairstyle, dress code, and also the choreography directly comes from the original K-pop music video. Another popular trend is K-pop random dance challenge in public. So what they do is that they play the K-pop songs, many different songs, and if you know the choreography, you jump in and you showcase the choreography and the next song comes in, you do not know, then you step back. So it's like a festival um, and also socializing based on your memorization of K-pop dance routine. This is something that I'm that I've been watching over and over again for, for, for I don't know. Um, so it's a battle between UCLA and USC. So you have like a UCLA team right here, and then you have USC team on the left side, and they are doing like a dance battle, but peaceful way. Um, something I also wanted to add is that I thought it might interest to you if you are studying like anthropology, government politics, or communication sociology. K-pop becomes almost like a um, cultural exchange, exchange at government levels. So there's a big annual K-pop cover dance festivals in Mexico, and they invite K-pop idols, and also I hope South Korea also invite artists from Mexico, and they are actually doing it too. They host annual K-pop cover dance festival, inviting all the dancers from across the world. So I think it shows how we are utilizing music and dance to better reach to um, other countries and also a wide range of communities. The last point that I want to highlight today is that a lot of K-pop fans is educated on social media. So the first question that I usually ask to my students, not online class because I don't get a chance to ask, but if it's in person, the first question that I always ask is that, have you ever been to a live theater? Like a live theater like this? Um, Maybe like a five or six students raise their hands out of 50. And you know what my next question would be. Have you ever used the social media like that? Everyone is raising hands. So your generation spend way more time to learn, also to watch, and also to create something based on the mediated education. And K-pop agency is always providing like a tutorial videos. It is even mirrored, so it doesn't make you get confused. And also there's an app. I just purchased the app um, for um, subscription. They are providing K-pop dance classes. 
and I'm teaching um, CSU Summer Art. Are you familiar with it? CSU Summer Art is a summer art collaborating with the entire California State Universities. And um, it, it, the application will open around January, so stay tuned because students can get up to, I think, six credits in a month. So it will speed up your uh, the graduation timeline. So I think I might be able to invite those um, the two people. They are very well known K-pop instructors on YouTube. I also contacted him. Um, you know Kyle Hanagami. He's the top choreographer on YouTube in LA. He also collaborates with a lot of K-pop artists. I also contacted this young lady. Um, I, I know I just. I'm really excited just talking about this collaboration. So what makes her really unique is that she grew up as a BTS fan. She grew up those music, practicing K-pop dance at home. And when she was 19 years old, she was able to choreograph for BTS and she actually appears in the music video. So it became sensational because now, and the, the dance magazine, which is very well known magazine, used a word, a K-pop fan turned celebrity choreographer. So it was a noun. Because K-pop is offering a lot of job opportunities and also entrepreneurial opportunities, I think that might be one of the reasons why young people um, are drawn to K-pop in addition to the health benefit. Lalami is another example. They, um, a few years ago, they started gathering some funding because they were K-pop cover dancers. They needed a little more resource. And it worked. So now they formally debuted as a K-pop group. Um, they are multi-ethnic, also racial groups. So I'm not going to explain all these things because it's in the book, but in the book, I sort of um, explain the, the differences between cultural appropriation or appreciation, right? And my idea is that a lot of dance majors, we, our students take ballet, hip hop, we also have capoeira class, postmodern dance class, and we don't say that they are doing cultural appropriation. So my idea is that when those young people um, spend a lot of energy spending their own money, like a few days before the midterm exam, they are practicing K-pop dance in the parking lot until midnight. It is actually weird to say those effort and also passion and fandom as a cultural appropriation. So I suggest how about we consider the bodily effort and also intention behind this practice. The highlight of the book actually comes from my case study in 2016 when I was a visiting faculty at Hamilton College. And I got a chance to work with refugee children from Thailand and they were pretty like a, a not necessarily a star, but they were very well known in the local community because they were refugee children, but also doing a K-pop dance. So I provided a movement workshop for a semester and also invited those dancers to the faculty dance concert, integrating hip-hop, K-pop, and also Asian shamanic dance and all those um, other styles. So the performance ends with um, a statement on the screen. Being a refugee is not a choice, but supporting them to change the world is a choice. And um, because the book took me um, like a, almost like five years, so I was able to trace how they grow up, because I met those children when they were in high school. And the book later became very confessional. I was able to recognize how much privilege I have and therefore how much privilege we have as an academic. As a person living in a country, we can get clean water anytime. 
And I also noticed that because I met almost like 40 K-pop dancers, some of them are teenagers, some of them are um, mid-20 or older than that. My discovery was that the less resources they have, the more they want to be K-pop idols. And I'm still trying to understand the, the ambition and also audacious hope that drives these young dancers to become like K-pop idols. Um, so later, I hope you enjoy reading the book. Now, what we are going to do is that I haven't explained the TikTok dance challenge. So if you ever try the TikTok dance challenge, you are not using the entire stage because you don't have, right, at home. If you have those big stage in your home, please invite me so that I can perform. So they are using small space and all the dances are within 15 seconds or so. So when TikTok Dance Challenge first came, um, of course, as an instructor, I wanted to provide something relatable. So I asked my students a few years ago, there's something TikTok Dance Challenge. So please submit one minute video as an assignment. Next day, I got a lot of email. <laughs> Professor, one minute is too long. And it was a little shocking to me because I've been performing on stage like three hours. And now I'm receiving comments that one minute is too long. And I was better, I was able to better understand the restriction and also the characteristics of social media as a stage. And they ended up like combining two different dance videos and going through all the unnecessary editings. So the, the reason the assignment is not 15 seconds is that you kind of owe those students who took my class a few years ago. So now, this is what I'm going to teach you during the intermission. Are you familiar with new jeans? Yeah, I'll be honest. The only reason I chose this is that uh, for some reason I came across this song and dance challenge a lot on my TikTok. And um, the song was very catchy and I just wanted to learn how to do it. So I started for myself and I was like, what if I teach, uh, I share this with my students, okay? Could you place the video? We are not going to try the entire tutorial video and the teacher's name is Savage Angels and if you go to write this timestamp you can learn the choreography so what we're gonna do is that there's gonna be 10 minutes of intermission feel free to go to restaurant but please come back and then right during the intermission I'm gonna provide a movement workshop okay is it clear okay can you please give the light in the auditorium Okay, I'll be right back. I just need to change my dress a little bit. <laughs> 